We're in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. I think we just have maybe six more slots, and we will uh, finish our prayer during 
uh, our two Sunday services. You've done a great job. Just have a few more slots. Let me encourage you, if you haven't taken a slot, take it. I, I think I had two people uh, that I can think of. We have five people in the last four weeks from New York that have cancer. Two this week, I had a, I don't even want to look at my, my phone anymore. Every time I'm getting a text, but we have five. I'm not talking about cousins or nephews. Five from our own body have cancer. Uh, Cedric, your wife, Charity, just I got a text from them. I'm just losing track of text I'm getting, so put it up there and let's begin to intercede, intercede bombard the gates of hell. The Bible says in Revelation that the gates of hell will not prevail. But we have our part to do and we have to intercede. So let me encourage you, go up there and, and put your prayer request and you'll have a lot of people interceding and praying for them. Uh, definitely on Sundays. Second Corinthians chapter 7. Uh, if you'll turn there with me. Paul is writing a letter, and Paul had a lot of problems. He have anytime you got people, you got problems, right? And that's just life. And when you're starting a whole, uh, uh, you're you're kind of that chief apostle, uh, laying out doctrine as he heard from the Holy Spirit as the early church was established. Uh, hard to believe, but there was a guy challenging Paul. Uh, they were some, quote, super apostles Paul talked about, that they thought they were all that in a bag of fries. And they were very charismatic. And people, even in churches, can be e easily fooled by charisma. They can be easily fooled by a guy that's very charismatic and hocus pocus. Uh, and so there were some guys that had been raised up in the church and kind of saying, Paul's kind of old-fashioned, kind of this and that. And uh, Paul had to straighten some things out in the church. He was teaching things that weren't the best. And so Paul had to straighten it out. Uh, and so here he says in verse 8, For even if we made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret, though I what? <laughs> sounds like an oxymoron, right? We'll go back and look at this. It almost sounds like, what? I don't regret it, but I regret it. A whole lot of regret going on in this passage. For I perceive that the same epistle made you sorry. They asked some teenage kids in a church, uh, what is an epistle? You know what one of the you said in church? It's the wife of an apostle. No, that's not that's not an epistle. Epistle means a letter, right? So he says, for I perceive that the same letter made you sorry. Remember, there's, there's two main books in your Bible, Corinthians. There's 1 Corinthians and there's 2. Now, it'd be like if I went to Iraq to help start a church and you guys were sending me, Herb, we got a, a, a really tough situation at New York. What do we do? And I wrote a letter back helping you, you know, uh, deal with some issues. That would be the first letter to New Hope. If then you responded to me and I wrote back saying, okay, this is what you do now in the case of this and, this and that, that would be the second letter to New Hope. Well, this is the second letter to the church in Corinth. He says, I perceive this the same epistle made you sorry, though it only did for what? A short time. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a what? Oh, that means there are different kinds of sorrow. There's godly sorrow and there's what? There is ungodly sorrow that's not coming from the Lord. We'll look at that in just a little bit. Uh, for you were made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer, uh, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow will produce what? Repentance leading to salvation. It's not just a prayer. If a person's really saved, their life will change. We've preached a real cheap gospel in America that if you'll just say a prayer, well, if it didn't change you, you didn't get Jesus. You just got a prayer. The Bible says that uh, for God to sorrow produces repentance that will lead to salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces what? Death. For observe this very thing that you sorrowed in a godly manner. And look at his, he says, what diligence did it produce in you? What clearing of yourselves? What indignation? You were mad at sinful things. You didn't tolerate them anymore. What fear, what vehement desire that you had now for the things of God? What zeal, what vindication? In all of these things, you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Therefore, although I wrote to you, I did not do it for the sake of him who had done this wrong. This is not the purpose of the letter, he's saying. Nor for the sake of him who suffered wrong, who was, uh, who was wrongly uh, treated, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear to you. Father, help us to understand the principle that you would want us to, to grasp. And Father, let it change, Lord, who we are. And Father, that alone will change, Lord, the external. So we just ask you, Lord... Have your way. We, we let our heart just be like an uh, x-ray before you. God, show us where we're sick so that we can become healthy. 
And God, we pray these things in Jesus' powerful name and all the people of God said. Church, we talked last week. I, I, I mentioned, hey, I was reading an article. That's, I got motion sickness. I didn't know there was a name for that. Well, we have to have a name for everything. And I started, as I read a, a passage of scripture, I started a series on uh, e- emotional sickness. Not just motion sickness, but emotion sickness. And last week, the first one, we, we talked about the emotion of being offended. And we looked at John the Baptist and how uh, he was offended because after all he's doing for God, here he is in prison and Jesus hasn't let him uh, free and he could have easily stumbled because of his pride. Hey, I'm just not going to really live for the Lord or, or be sold out or witness like I sh- I'm supposed to because what does it matter? He refused to be offended. Then we looked at the Syrophoenician woman and she was a lady that had a daughter who had a demon in her. Of course, in America, we would just say it's, uh, uh, you know what I'm saying, it's schizophrenic. Of course, there's no such thing as demon in the United States, uh, but unfortunately, they haven't gone on vacation. They're still alive and well in our country. And, and so you know the story with that Syrophoenician woman. She, she keeps asking Jesus, and Jesus almost appears aloof, almost kind of, almost kind of rude. He doesn't respond to her. And keep, she keeps saying, Jesus, can you heal my, set my daughter free? And, he, and finally, he says, you know what? It's not right to cast bread before dogs. That's pretty offensive. If you're, a, if you're a prideful person, you get offended. But if you know God doesn't make mistakes and you have to say, okay, God's allowed. Could God stop every bad thing from happening to you? Of course he could. Is he going to? No. There are some things he's going to allow said to you by a person. He could stop it. There are people who are going to bless you out in the worldly sense. He could stop it, but he'll allow it. And that lady said, no, but even dogs get crumbs off the table. He says, oh, that's what I was testing you. See if you're going to get your, be a little baby and get your feelings hurt and leave. But because you answered that way, then your daughter is going to be delivered from her demons. We talked about being offended and not letting it be a stumbling block hurting you. You're still saved, but you're not walking as bold and strong as you need to because you're still fighting this offense back here. This week, I want us to continue, and I want us to look at another emotion that causes us sickness. I think I was sharing off the cuff in the first service. There was a, a friend of mine whose dad was on, like, on the tourism board when I was growing up in Brownsville, Texas. They brought in uh, the, the, the most well-known, hip, hottest uh, uh, singer in the United States at that time. And if you're old, if you're sad, say 40 and over, you'll remember her. But long story short, my uh, friend's dad was on the tourism board. And so he got the privilege of taking out this lady, this hip, you know, top number one music star, uh, when she came to Brownsville and they went out to eat. And I thought, you lucky dog. But she sang a song that, you ever heard a song on the radio and you just can't stand it? I mean, it's just the corniest. Ch- All of us have one, right? Yeah. Uh, there are just some dogs, who let the dogs out? Who? It's like, that's a hit. <laughs> Only in America could that be a hit. You know, I think was, there were some dumb songs. But she had a hit song, and it just drove me nuts. I wanted to just reach through the radio and just <laughs> st- quit writing in such a ridiculous, cheesy song. And, and some of you will remember it. It became a huge song for uh, ladies that were doing exercise and workouts. And it was called, Let's Get physical, Olivia Newton-John. I could not stand that. (laughs) Let's get physical. Remember that? How many of you remember this? that? I wanted to slap her silly. Come over, Olivia Newton-John. Shame on you for writing such a ABC ridiculous. (laughs) But I was was thinking about that song. I thought, you know what? There is a lot of emphasis in our country on being fit physically. And I'm not against it. If you want to run, jog, whatever, you know, more power to you. May the force be with you and, you know, all that kind of stuff. You know what I'm saying? Just do what you got. But there's way more of a focus on the physical than there is on the spirit and the emotion. And if you'll take care of that, you'll be fit physically. And so that's what I want us to talk about this morning. I I want us to talk about, there's a whole lot of regret here. And so I've titled the message this morning, Church, as we get started on, on emotion, sickness, how to be well in your soul, facing regret and remorse, God's way. Boy, there's a whole lot of regret, remorse going on from Paul and, and from the disciples that are there. And so without giving, being real technical, what's the difference between remorse, regret? They're real close. One's a verb, one's a, one's a noun. Uh, it's like, what's the difference between mad and sense or angry? Just different degrees. Regret would be when you're looking back. 
You know what I'm saying? You're looking back with sorrow over something you should have done that you didn't or you did do that you shouldn't have done. That's regret. Remorse would be a little bit more intense, kind of like if you get an invitation to go someplace and you're not able to make it a wedding or whatever, you, you'll probably say something like, I re what? I regret not able to make it, but you wouldn't say, you know, I'm remorseful. That's kind of too strong. So I'm going to use those words interchangeably, okay? Regret, remorse, they're about the same thing, just one's more intense than the other. But I want to talk about how do we get healed from those experiences, those things back here that have caused a lot of pain in our lives. You ready? Ready to jump in? All right, let's jump in this morning. And I'm going to share with you three different type of of uh, regrets that are not from God. Not every time that there is a regret is it the Lord. And as you, hopefully as you get older in Christ, you'll be able to discern, look back, because, oh, you'll say, oh, the Bible does say that Satan disguises himself as an angel of. That means he can make his thought in your mind, you think it's God's thought. And you have to know the word and filter and say, wait a minute, that's not coming from God. But I remember one time when I first got saved, I could take you to uh, Houston, Texas. And I was at Westbury Church. And uh, we were singing a hymn. Of course, that's all you did back in the 80s, right? You just used hymnals. And we were singing. And this this ridiculous thought came to me. Man, and I beat myself up. I don't even think I sang for the next 15 minutes or whatever. I didn't pay attention. Man, I I remember whipping myself. You're the worst Christian on earth. You don't even shouldn't be in church. I mean, I was just beating myself up, whipping myself. And it took me like six months later. I was a brand new Christian, maybe less than a year old in Christ. But it took me a while to realize, wait a minute, some guy was teaching preaching on spiritual warfare, and he said, you know, were these thoughts you were wanting and desiring? And I thought, no, no, I was worshiping in the middle of the Lord. Where did that thought come from? And I thought, oh, not every thought that comes across my mind is God's. And I thought, Satan, you dastardly, wicked foe. You beat me up that whole time and made me think that quick thought you put in my mind that I quickly repeat, oh, no. I thought, Oh, I got a lot to learn about this spiritual warfare stuff. So let me share with you some, some truths this morning that I'm excited about. What is false regret? In, in a, if you'll back up to chapter 2, you can look at it later. But Paul says, we're not ignorant of what? I'm not ignorant of how Satan works. And Paul was obviously wise in that sense. Here's the first one. This ongoing sense of guilt or shame for which you already repented of. If there is something that you've already repented of and you keep feeling guilty and guilty over that, there's a good chance that that guilt, that that shame, that that regret, that that remorse is not coming from God. Satan knows how to disguise himself and allow his thoughts to make you think are God's thoughts. And like I did, I just kept beating myself and repenting and repenting and repenting over and over and over and over. I spoke with a guy, one of our members, who attended a, a type of church that taught you almost have to, you have to work for your forgiveness. And he said, Herb, I did. I tried. I tried. I had a bad past. And I kept trying to say, God, please forgive me. And I didn't understand. I didn't understand the grace of God. And I kept trying to do it on my own. Here's the first truth. The ongoing sense of guilt or shame for which you've already repented of. If you've repented of something and it keeps coming back to you. Listen, it happened just in Texas recently. Remember that one guy that was putting bombs in packages? I think it was FedEx or UPS or whatever, right? If that's happening in the E-Town area, that somebody's sending bombs through FedEx, and somebody comes to your door, knocks, they look official, FedEx got the uniform on, and they come and, and they say, Herb, would you sign for this? And when I listen to the box, I hear a slight tick, tick, tick. How many of you can say, I'll sign for it? What do you have a choice to do? Take that box back to hell where it came from. Some of you learn, need to learn to start doing that with thoughts that are coming. You've already repented of, and they keep coming back and harassing you. Here's the second truth. Here's uh, uh, John, the revelator. Yeah, that's good. Can you go back to that one where I kicked the script? Yeah. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God of the power of his Christ, they have come for the accuser of our what? The accuser of our brethren who accused us, the church, the godly people, who accused them before our God day and night. That's what he lives to do. Has been what? 
Here's the second truth that I want to share with you regarding a false guilt. Because Paul said that, he was saying, you know what, I regret doing this, though I don't regret doing that. What does he mean by that? Anybody have children here? Anybody have children that have disobeyed? That's all? Man, you got some, per- oh, okay, you got perfect kids. All of us have, there you go. Anybody have to discipline them? You had to do something, they did something, and so you matched it with, with you know, it's like if somebody jaywalks, you don't give them 20 years, right, in, in jail. But you matched it for what they did, and then they went out and did something stupid to spite you or whatever. You regretted it, but you didn't regret it. You regret what the consequences of the stupid choice they made after you disciplined them. But if you have to do it again, you would have to still discipline them. Other than that, if you don't, then they're going to control the house. Then they're going to say, if you try to discipline me, I'm going to do that. And so therefore, they're the parent, not you. We've all done that. We understand that. So when Paul says, I regret it, though I don't regret it. You know what I'm saying? What he's saying was, I did the right th- thing. I'm, in, I'm, I'm grieved over the reaction of the person that didn't respond to God. So here he's saying, John, that Satan accuses the people of God day and night. Here's the second truth that I want to share with you this morning, and it's this. When Satan makes you feel guilty for something that you're not guilty of. Most of you were here on Easter when I shared the illustration of my brother who, because of the, the past, he didn't deal with it properly. That, remember, I, I said he got that crucifix and he put himself against that, that, uh, that brick wall and he had me pull the lever and I was like a 13-year-old kid. I had no clue. What would have happened? It was just a the goodness of God that my brother lived. But what would have happened if he would have, if it would have hit his neck, that bumper instead of his jaw, and crushed it, and he'd have been paralyzed for life, a quadriplegic or paraplegic? Could Satan have made me feel guilty the rest of my life? Would that be a true guilt? No, I did nothing rather than do what my brother said, you know, pull the, the emergency. I'm not a 13-year-old kid. I don't know. I just did what he did. Could Satan have ate my lunch if I had allowed him the rest of my life? So you understand false guilt. Things that happen here that he is guilty. And uh, if you were here about seven years ago, uh, during a funeral we had for, for one of our members, uh, my brother came to preach a, a men's retreat. I don't know, I'm losing track. Maybe it's eight or nine years ago now. But longest story short, when he did, God did some neat things. And at the end, uh, he came and then preached on that Sunday morning. We did a Friday and Saturday retreat there at one of the lakes here in our, in our state. And he preached on Sunday morning. Afterwards, one of the guys that was at the retreat uh, was a member, was here, and God really spoke to him. And he said, Ted, I need to talk. And boy, we stayed for a long time. And this is a story that our member shared. A young guy, probably mid-20s, I'm guessing. Um, he was about, give or take a year, about eight years old living in San Antonio. And all of us have a pesky neighbor when you're young that wants to hang around you, you know, a little or shorter. And there was like a little six-year-old girl that lived in his neighborhood. And she always wanted to come over and play. He didn't want to play with a six-year-old girl. And he remembers seeing a Tom and Jerry movie. And in the Tom and Jerry movie, there's a cat that gets run over and comes back to life. And so our member as an eight-year-old doesn't want the girl to come over and gets a ball a little beach ball, and just kind of throws it across the street, and the little girl goes after it, says, go after it and chase it. Well, she does. And guys, it's one of those one in a 10 million kind of things, because when she did, a car's coming right at the time. She's too young to pay attention, and she gets hit bad. Now, here's another one in a 10 million. The ambulance was on strike that week for higher wages. And so in San Antonio, on that particular day and weekend, they were on strike for higher wages. And so instead of an ambulance getting there in three, five, seven, eight, nine minutes, it was two hours before they finally got to our hospital and the little girl died. The member of our church said, Herb, every day when I look in the mirror, I say, I hate you and you have no right for anything good to ever happen to you in your life. And he lived with that terrible regret. And so when we talked and Ted talked, we said, listen, you were eight years old. You didn't know what you were doing. You were just threw a ball across the street. You wanted the girl to quit pestering you. We've all done something similar to that. But the odds of that happening, a car coming, she didn't look, an ambulance strike. I mean, all of that. And so you've allowed Satan to eat your lunch for almost 20 years. And he got free. And man, he was like a changed guy for the... The next four, five, six months of his life till his life ended early. But the point is this in your outline B. False guilt comes when Satan makes you feel guilty for what you're not guilty of. 
It's not, I've, I've met wives before who have been really, really mistreated physically bad by their husband. And they would say, if I would only know, stop it. <laughs> Nothing ever deserves a husband hitting you and striking you because you didn't make his breakfast fast enough or you burnt the toast. Stop looking back and saying, if I would have only. Are you following me? There's a lot of false guilt that people, even Christians, deal with because they don't know how to appropriate the grace of God. B, when Satan makes you feel guilty for what he is guilty of. You imagine somebody plants marijuana in my glove box. And as I'm driving, somebody calls the police. I think Herb's got marijuana in his glove box. The police pull me over and they say, it's marijuana. I shouldn't feel guilty. It's not mine. It might look that way. It's placed there. Satan is a master at disguising and manipulating and heaping guilt on the people of God when it was his fault to begin with. Be careful. Here's, a, here's the, uh, the third one I want to share with you. What else is a false guilt? Because Paul talks about a worldly sorrow and a godly sorrow. And Satan is the master, if you're not careful, of causing you to live back in Heartbreak Hotel way back there. Here's the third thing that I want to say to you. It's when you... Uh, when you feel ashamed and you don't know why, you just, you're stuck. And, and, and there's nothing specific about that. Y'all remember, guys, I'm old enough to remember back in our days, they used to have something called vinyl records, right? I think they're making a comeback. Y'all remember vinyl records? They were 33 RPMs and 45 RPMs. I remember the first single I bought. I think I was about 10. I wasn't a Christian kid. I was 10 years old. And it was a song by the Rolling Stones, my first little 33. And it was a goodbye, Ruby Tuesday. Who could remember? I can't believe the words are coming back to me after 40-something years. And I was there just, I was doing my air guitar in my room, 10 years old, and all that kind of. But back in those days, if you get a little sun, if you left that phonograph player, yeah, remember that? If you left it close to the sun to get a little warm, remember that? And so if you would hear the song and you'd play it again, you'd put that needle on it. For some of you younger folks, you've got to just have faith and envision all this. But they'd have needles, and you'd have a needle on it. And so it, would, it got stuck on, goodbye, Ruby Tuesday, goodbye. Said, okay, a thousand times you said goodbye to Ruby Tuesday. And you'd have to get a nickel or a dime or a quarter and stick it on top of the needle, right? And so when you put it on, it then would play the whole song. Satan is a master at uh, getting you stuck back there and then always accusing you. See, God convicts you. The Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation. It doesn't say there's no conviction. And there's a bad teaching. I'll be careful. One guy saying, there's, you don't ever sin after you get saved. Baloney, read your Bible. <laughs> read your Bible. That sounds good, but it's not scriptural. Satan will when God convicts you, he's specific. Herb, the way you spoke to your child. Herb, the way you spoke to your elder. The way you spoke to your wife. God is always specific when he convicts you of something. Satan is always general. You feel bad, but you just don't know why. And he's saying, he always makes it personal. You, how dare you go to church? After all you've learned, you should have. And he'll always condemn you and your person and your character. One of the ways to know is it's false guilt when you just feel trashy and yucky, but there's never a reason why. If it's God, he will point out, son or daughter, this is what you did. This is what I want you to do about it. But the condemnation is coming from the kingdom of hell. And he'll condemn you personally. And he will revile you and everything else that goes with that. When you feel ashamed, when you feel regret, but you don't know why. <clears throat> Probably coming from the kingdom of hell. All right, so let's move then to how do we deal with regret if we, we can't find peace? Uh, who here could say, Herb, I don't have no regret on anything. Listen to me. You have, you either now or you have in the past or you will in a week or a month or a year or the next year or two. There will be something you'll look back and say, doggone it, that wasn't wise. Man, that was foolish. The way I responded to my spouse or to my coworker, all of us are going to have those times where, and, and, and it transcends every culture, every, every generation, every nation. Every one of us has to deal with, with regret. But unfortunately for many of us, 
It hinders and harasses and causes us to be weak in many areas of our walk with Christ. How do we deal? Let me then, I have to say this, there is, there is false guilt. There is guilt that the evil one, that somebody will place upon you that has nothing to do with God. Boy, the Pharisees were always trying to make Jesus guilty of something and he refused him. The only person that has never had a regret in his life is Jesus. But all the rest of us are going to have to deal with it. Let's deal with it in a godly way. Otherwise, we'll, be, we'll have emotion sickness. Here's a couple of scripture verses. Herb, what if I've done what you said, but I still don't have any peace? Look at Zacchaeus in Luke chapter 19. Remember the story? When Jesus came to the place, he looked and said, hurry, Zacchaeus, come down. And Zacchaeus heard about Jesus, kind of short, couldn't see over the crowd, gets up on a tree. And then Jesus stops, and out of all the people, he picks him out to come. Let's go out to dinner. Can you imagine others saying, well, that's not fair, Jesus. I asked you first to go out to eat, and you turned me down. What's the matter, Jesus? You don't like me, right? But he picked Zacchaeus, and you know the story. Zacchaeus talks to Jesus. The Spirit of God speaks to him, convicts him. He says, that's, that's the Messiah. That's the one we're looking for. You know, I, be my Lord. You know the story. And look there at underline verse uh, 8. He said to the Lord, behold, Lord, what? Half of my possessions I will give to the what? And for those... I have defrauded of anything, I will what? If I overcharged people, it wasn't fair, I stuck it to them. It's kind of like if a hurricane comes, that jug of water you buy at Walmart is 69 cents, all of a sudden a grocery store becomes, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, and so the Spirit of God speaks to me, he says, hey, Jesus. And he says, what? Right off the bat, man, if those people that I have defrauded, I'll pay them back what? Four times as much. I'm going to give half of what I got to the poor. He was sensitive to the conviction of the Lord. He was still saved, but that was proof that the Lord was doing a work in his job. What does James 5.16 say? James 5.16 says, Is anyone among you what? Sick? What? Then he must call for the elders of the church and they're to what? Pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore that person who's sick. Now look closely. And the Lord will raise them up. And what's the next part say? Well, no, if, if. That means there is times in your life that you're sick because of sin. There are times in life that that is going to be the reason. Now, the danger is when people say every time. You know, no. But it could be, and you should come. I remember talking to a lady one time. She was in the hospital, and I just wanted to just shake her hand and say, can I use you forever as an illustration? She said, this illness that I have, I know why I have it. I have been rebellious towards my husband's authority, and as I'm lying here in the hospital bed, this is happening because I have rebelled against the authority God has put in my life. And I thought, whoa, <laughs> that's an honest person. Heard from the Lord and already saying, this is the reason why. Look, and if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Therefore, what? Confess your what? To one another, to that person that it needs to be shared with. The internet has done some wonderful things, done some bad things, but some wonderful things. One was, after I got saved, I kept having this memory of when I was about a nine-year-old kid, give or take a year, I lived in Brownsville, Texas, and there was four corners going towards the beach. And my dad would have me go every Saturday morning, walk to go buy him a Saturday morning newspaper. And he'd give me a dime. And my big choice was, do I buy two nickel candy bars that aren't named brand, or one like a Snickers or a Milky Way, and I'd be there for five, eight minutes every Saturday morning. Do I get the two that aren't as good tasting, or the one? Real crucial decisions in life, right? A lot of stress when you're a young kid back in the late 60s. So anyway, I remember one time, and there was a, it was starting to get warm, and it's warm in Brownsville from March to November. It's in the 90s to 100s. But there was a pair of swim trunks, and I couldn't afford them. They were 2 or $3. But I really liked them. And I looked to the left, and I looked to the right, and I said to myself, self, they're on sale. They're five-finger discount today. And so I grabbed them, and I put them in my shorts. I had shorts on. And I was the skinniest little raunchy kid. So I must have looked like I was pregnant. Right? I was a kid with a pair of swim trunks. And I snuck out of there. Well, that was, I don't know, eight or nine-ish, you know, when a Christian kid. Now I'm in my late 20s, near close to 30. I'm in Fort Worth. And God keeps bringing back El Centro to me, El Centro. And now that with the internet and everything, I thought, oh, I can't do anything about it. That's 400 something miles away, Dallas, Fort Worth, all the way to Brownsville. You know, it's I can't do anything about it. And I thought, oh, find out the name. So I typed in El Central Brownsville, and it gave me the address. 
And so I wrote a, a nice letter. I said, Dear El Centro, here's, and I like quadruple the price of what it probably was because I added 20 years of inflation and all that kind of stuff. So I said, here's whatever, 20 something bucks. And I said, I became a Christian and I gave my life to Christ. And I stole as a, as a little eight or nine year old kid, I stole a pair of swim trunks and the spirit of God has convicted me and I can't get no peace. And so I want to let you know that I'm sorry I'm wrong, that Christ has taught me not to do that, and I apologize for taking from you, and here's the whatever the 20 some dollars in cash I put in there. I'd love to say to you that Olive Brownsville got saved and everybody else central became a, a priest or a nun or, you know what I'm saying? I don't know what happened, but this is what I'm saying to you. Never again, after I sent that letter off with the money, guess what never bothered me again? It was, it was gone. You know why sometimes we feel guilty? Listen to me very carefully. Because we are. <laughs> yeah, there's the faults in the world. But, but there also, consider the fact. I remember reading of a guy. And he wrote a letter to the IRS. And I want to let you know that on this, um, the most recent uh, income tax forms, I have not been honest. I have been deceptive. And I did not pay everything that I was supposed to pay to the government. And I feel convicted by it. And here is five, my $500 to let you know that I am convicted and I'm sorry. And then he wrote a little P.S. on the bottom. P.S. If I still don't have any peace, I'll send you the rest. <laughs> this is what I'm saying. Listen to me. Here is the flip side of regret and remorse. It's possible you're still dealing with regret because you haven't fully repented. You've partially repented. Are you following me? If I was to repent of having stolen Ken Preston's lawnmower, oh Lord, would you please forgive me? And God says, that's great, but what else do I need to do? Return the lawnmower. <laughs> so maybe you said, God, forgive me for slandering that person, but you haven't what? You haven't gone and said, you know, what I said about you in front of those people was not true. Would you please forgive me? I slandered you in front of people. Here's the second part. How to deal with regret if we haven't found any peace? Thoroughly confess and repent before God, and if needed, before man. Some of you are so close to finding man peace, <laughs> just like as God began to lead me to do those things, and has over the years. Boy, there was a trump. Satan could no longer harass me in that area. Could not just rake me over the coals. Okay, so then let's then move to, because uh, this is what you need to know, church. There's some ridiculous laws in our nation. There's a lot of good ones compared to other nations. You know, there's some nations, women can't even drive a car, can't get a license. So, I mean, praise the Lord. But there's some bad laws in our country. There's what's called statute of limitations. That means there are certain crimes that if you commit, if after 10 or 15 or 20 years, guess what can happen? Somebody did something to you and you want to go before the judge and he says, oh, Herb, I'd love to. Timmy, I'd love to. You know what I'm saying? Steve, I'd love to. But 20 years has passed. And you're saying, wait a minute. What does years passing have anything to do with anything? In heaven, it doesn't. <laughs> so God does it. Oh, Herb, doggone it. When you did that, that was wrong. But it's been 20 years. Son, you got away with it. I guess I just won't hold you accountable. And with God, there is no... Statue of limitations, you understand that. He loves you way too much to allow you to still do what you did without having made it right. Here's number three then in your outline. And that's this. What do we learn from regret? Is there anything good can come from it? Absolutely, yes. And this is where a lot of people, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just boil it down to two things this morning. How does, what can be learned from, is, is every bit of regret bad? Can something good come from it? Absolutely, yes. And that's where as a cr growing Christian, you need to, to understand this basic truth. If I am thinking about something that's already been dealt with, then I need to take advantage of it in two different ways. And let me share both of them with you this morning. Uh, the first one you can find in Acts 8 and Acts chapter 9. Here's a guy by the name of Saul. You know who this Saul becomes, right? This is not Saul of the Old Testament. This is not King Saul. This is Paul, okay? Now, here's Paul before he was saved when he was known as Saul. 
Now Saul was what? Okay, this passage before that, if, you're, if you got your Bible to Acts 8, that's Stephen. Remember, Stephen has been bold, blunt. He told the false religious preachers of his day that they were responsible for the, for the death of Christ. They were acting hypocrites. And how many of you think they said, wonderful, thanks. Could you come back next Sunday? You know what I'm saying? We'll have you on our satellite churches. We'll pipe you into all the churches throughout the state of Kentucky. No, you know how they responded. They said death to Stephen. Guess who was right there saying, right on target? No. Oh. At that time, a minor persecution, a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except what? The apostles were strong enough to say, we're going to stay here, help this little young church grow. The rest of you take off scattered throughout. You go to Owensboro, or here the, the judge over there, or the policemen are, 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 are sensitive to Christians, and you won't be arrested and thrown in jail. So they scattered throughout, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial, and they made great lamentations. They wept over this godly guy the church did. As for Saul, he made what? Havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off what? I want you to picture that. So he's like the Osama bin Laden. Can you imagine him coming and grabbing your wife by the hair and just yanking her out of the house, pulling her? And you can't do anything because there's four guys with swords <laughs> and spears right there. And all you can do is say, you know, help, help, Lord, help, do something. That was Saul, okay? In case you're thinking he was this unbelievable guy his whole life, born with a, a silver spoon in his mouth. Look at the next chapter, look at nine. Then Saul, then Saul still breathing what? Threats and what? murder against us, the church, against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest. He says, man, I, want a I don't want a restraining order. I want, I want a, a license, uh, and I want a, a, to uh, be able to arrest, right? A search warrant, arrest warrant. Ask letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus. Synagogue is, a, is the word for the Jewish people used for church, for the churches of Damascus, for the Jewish people. So that if he found any who, who were of the way, people who followed Christ back then were called people of the way. Isn't that funny? But that's in Scripture. So if they said people of the way, because Jesus is the way. So they're the, they're the followers of the, the one they say is the only way. So that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might what? Bring them bound. Okay, that's, that's Paul. <laughs> Just a little glimpse of how he was uh, before he got saved. Now, if you're in Corinthians, go to chapter 2. Back up, you're in 7. Look at chapter 2. Here's dealing with another situation. And I think we have it. Uh, do we have it up on the screen? Uh, yeah, this is a good one. Um, same thing. He's dealing with the guy who's, who's rebelling and the church is under a false grace. Hey, we're all about grace. We don't deal with that stuff. Well, then, then you're not a church. You're a club. Let me explain to you. If you belong to the country club in town, golf, country club, tennis, country club, whatever, and, and, and you're not living a godly life, maybe you're, maybe you're smoking or you're, you're snorting or maybe you're fooling around on your spouse. Do they care as long as you're paying your monthly dues? They're not going to get involved as long as you're paying your what? We're not a club. We're a church. Do you understand that? We're not like a country club. And Paul was trying to explain that. We're a church of grace. No, that means you let anything happen. It's, you're, it's called you're a coward and don't have a backbone and don't make the church separate from the world. That's what makes the church different. And that's why the world is trying to shove in the church's face. You will tolerate and accept all these things, but they're sinful. If we did that, we wouldn't be the church anymore. We'd be like you. We'd be the world. But God has called us out of the world. Ecclesia, we are apart from you. We cannot agree with those things because they're not of God. <laughs> so are you following that? No, but I determined within myself I wouldn't come to make you sorrow. Look, almost like the same passage. For if I make you sorrowful, who's going to make me glad? The guy that, that he was uh, convicting that wasn't repenting. And I wrote this very thing to you, lest when I come I should have sorrow over those from whom I should be happy about. They should be repenting. And, and instead of saying, we're a tolerant church having confidence in you that all my joy is the joy of you all. That's what makes me happy when I see you guys walking in godliness and holiness. Four, now look at this closely. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with what? That page you have right there, if you got your Bible open, if that was the original manuscript, it would probably be tear stains on it. Look what he's saying. There's four. Not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the what? 
I haven't wrote this because I'm happy about saying this guy needs to be removed from the body of Christ until he repents. He says, that, that bothers me. That's the same guy that was going around arresting Christians and killing Christians and imprisoning Christians. And now he's having to write a letter saying, guys, you got to deal with this person in charge. You guys are turning your elders, you're turning your head. You got to deal with them. This is clear cut sin. We're not talking about a guy a jaywalking. Okay, let's give him 10 years and sing, sing. No, we're not talking about that. We're talking about gross immoral sin. And they weren't dealing with it. And look what Paul is saying now. Look at that. Much affliction, verse 4, anguish of heart, and with many tears. I'm doing this because I want to see the guy really get right with God. Where did that change come from? From a guy that was, to a guy that was tender and having to deal with a Christian who was walking in the flesh and, and not walking in the spirit. And Paul recognized Man, this guy's making a terrible choice in the churches. Some of the people in the church aren't standing up for it, and this is grieving me. What's my point then? As we talk about looking back and regret over some things, here's two things I want you to learn. Here's the first one. Allow your past to make you what? Listen, have you ever blown it, and then you wanted to really still criticize and judge somebody, but then the thought comes to your mind, who are <laughs> Who are you in light of the grace that just came to you ready to jump on somebody so quick? Anybody had that other than just me? But you know what? If you look back and say, oh, I hardly made any mistakes. Shoo, I've been good my whole life. You're going to be harsh and legalistic with people. You're going to be d demanding and critical and finding flaws. Paul then, recognizing how he was before the Spirit of God came to his life, is dealing with people. But instead of being happy about having to nail them, it's killing them. Because I'm realizing, man, I'm having to really wound a person. Because they're blind. They don't see it. I have to be direct and blunt. They're not understanding it. And this guy that used to be harsh and cruel and imprisoned Christians, and some, were, uh, some he put to death, now all of a sudden is bothered that he has to tell people, guys, deal with this person. Remove him until he's ready to repent and do it the way of God. Amen. You know, over the years, people have come in and out of New Hope from our town. Many ministers have fallen uh, pastors, worship leaders, youth pastors, a couple from one church, the largest church in our area over the years have come through New Hope. Uh, some are only here a week or two, and a lot of you don't know them. They'll t let me know, or I'll recognize them, and I'll have lunch with them, and I'll try to talk to them and encourage them. Some of the most sympathetic people that I have met have been former ministers in our town that have something has happened at their church, they've blown it, they've made mistakes, or whatever. And they want to just come someplace for a week or two till they go to the next place. And man, some of them have really been encouraging. Man, I heard, I, man, I sense the spirit of God during the worship time. The people, there was a genuineness. They, man, a lot of people talked to me and came up and and recognized me or greeted me. I'll ha hear a lot of that over the years. They'll say, man, the people were engaging. I saw them participate. They were really listening. They were taking notes. They really seem like they really. They're not just dead people on a log. But you know who some of the the most critical people have been over the years. You know who, who that have been? People who are in the ministry, who have been in church before, were leaders, and they have fallen, and they've made mistakes. They saw how hard it was to get people to, to come to want to follow Christ and be wholly devoted. And all of a sudden, it's like, have you forgotten how hard it was, and here you are being critical and harsh? You've missed the whole point of why you're even here, friend. Here's the truth I want to share with you. If you're looking back, only look back long enough to realize, you know what? Apart from the Lord, I could do what that person is doing. Amen. You know what? Apart from the Lord, I've done what that person is doing. It's going to move you from being harsh with people and critical to people to always try to bend, bend over and just help anything you can with. Because you realize when you were messed up, when you weren't really, and you, though you were saved, you weren't walking in the Spirit, how you stumbled and made a dumb choice and how you allowed a foolish decision to cause you to make stupid, foolish choices. You're able to look back. And when you do, then when you look forward, you're, you're much more sympathetic and compassionate. Don't forget when you look back, to learn from it. Otherwise, you've thrown away that whole reason. You've wasted that regret. Here's the second and the last one I want to share with you. Many years ago, one of the, like I said, pastors have come and have gone. He's moved away from E-Town. 
he shared with me that uh, he'd worked at a place. I won't mention the place, but when you get sick, you probably go there, but I won't mention the place. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and long story short, he, he, this, guy's a, man, this guy loves the Lord. I know him. He's, this guy's solid. A lady at that particular place of employment had told a flat-out lie about this guy that could risk serious problems with him and his wife, perhaps him and his job, and he was livid. And he was angry, which, you know, that's a human part. You might get fired because somebody flat out lied about you. Hey, listen, not everybody that comes out and confesses something is always telling the truth. Right. Not always. A wise person listens to what? Both sides do not make a judgment. I've had some of the sweetest people, at least, on the surface talk to me. And then I found out later they lied through their teeth. But they came across so sweet and nice. Listen to both sides before you form an opinion. I could say that and preach that every week and we'll still mess up. Long story short, he told me he was struggling with anxiety, with fear, and with depression. And so he prays that, Lord, this has got to stop. I can't stand this. This is killing me. And the Lord said to him, you're angry and that's the problem. And he said it didn't take him long to know who he was angry at. He was angry at that lady at work that flat out had told a just lie that could have got him in major, major problem. But this is what he said God said to him. He said, Herb, the Lord said, I want you to forgive her, but I, w I don't want you to get, go to her and tell her, you did this and that to me and I'm forgiving you. He said, do not do that. That's between you and I. I'll deal with her, but I want you to forgive her in your heart. He said, Herb, I did. He said, man, I was sick and tired of the anxiety, this, the fears, the, the depression that I was in, all that kind of stuff. He said, I did. He said, Herb, is the most incredible thing. And you think I'd know this as a pastor. But the moment I forgave her, all of a sudden, it all stopped. <laughs> Isn't that something? The Bible, the Bible is true. So what am I saying? Uh, let me cover this last point then this morning. Look at uh, Philippians chapter 3. Uh, don't look at the answer. Close your eyes. Go back one. Don't look at the answer. Don't look at... There you go. And that's a good one too, but go back one more Philippians. Do I have just Philippians? Okay. Yeah, there we go. Not that I've already attained or I'm already perfected. Guys, I haven't... I'm not perfect yet. Paul says I haven't reached it. But I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I don't count myself as having arrived. I'm perfect. But one thing I do... One thing I do... What? Okay. Could Paul live in regret? Man, he did some he did some terrible things to the body of Christ. You imagine when Paul would go back to cities 10, 15 years later, and he would walk, and then that lady over there, he had his husband, he had uh, her husband killed. And then over there in the corner, she's never seen her daughter after Paul had her arrested, and they have no idea where she's at or she's alive. Can you imagine that? There was a lot of people that he, okay, so I'm walking in the church, and how are you guys looking at me? <laughs> and I have to think, who am I to preach the Word of God knowing what I've done to that person in that town in Glendale, Upton, and Sonora? That guy's wife was head chopped off. That guy's daughter or son uh, is on an island. We have no idea if they're... Just think of all the different people. And when he would walk in and he had to deal with relatives, uncles, and nephews, and cousins, or those kind of people, and then Paul was having to preach grace to them. Hmm. And you know what he had to finally do? Forgetting what? You got you to give that over to God. Because if you don't, the stupid things that we've all done, they'll eat your lunch. Yes. They will harass you. When I did street ministry, all those years, just eight and a half, nine years, almost a decade, I realized that a lot of those people are not homeless. Listen to me. Our government is so deceived, throwing away hundreds of billions of dollars. Most of them are choosing not to live in a home. They have... They have nephews and cousins and uncles. They have moms and dad and grandparents. They have brothers and sisters. A lot of them are married, have children. A lot of them have children. So why aren't they in a home? You know why they're not at home? They don't want to be at home because the dad, the, the wife says, you can't come here and get drunk every night. And so they'll put boundaries. And you know what that homeless guy will say? I'm just going to be honest with you. <laughs> You're getting bamboozled by D.C. Now, there are some that are. There are some. And my heart would always go out to the ladies. My heart would go out to and the, the boyfriend and husband would kick them out on the street. My husband always went out to the ladies with kids. And my, my heart would out, go out to a lot of the, the, the war veterans. A lot of the homeless people were veterans of Vietnam and et cetera. 
And this is what would happen. There's one case after one of our services where we would preach at the Salvation Army and the Union Gospel Mission. One guy came forward and he was real contrite and said, you know, I'm, I'm responding to, you know, Jesus and this whole thing. But he says, I've got something that's killing me, eating me up. I said, what is it? And if you're a soldier, you can understand that. And even if you're not, you can understand it. When you're kind of like the ISIS back then, some of the uh, the Vietnamese, I guess they would get little girls or young girls and they would strap them with bombs, kind of like they do now, ISIS. And then they would walk to into a village where all the American soldiers were and guess what they would do? And so apparently at this particular time, this young girl comes forward and I guess obviously there's the language barrier between the Vietnamese and the American soldiers and try to get her to stop and she and apparently it looked like she reached in for something and, and you got to make a decision. You know, if that's a bomb, all my buddies or my fellow buddy soldiers were dead and you're the guy on duty. And so he made that decision and he shot and killed her. And it appears there wasn't a bomb on her. I believe the story that he told me. And he told me about just, you know, and so a lot of times what they'll do is they'll, they'll solve their regret with, see, if you got a drinking problem, go back that there's something that you're not dealing with. That's the issue. And I said, son, I said, son, I said, sir, you did the best that you could at that moment. She was approaching you quickly. You thought she had a bomb. You, you were here to de defend our freedom in our country, defend your fellow soldiers that were there, that were trusting you to be on the lookout. You made the best decision. And sometimes in war, those things happen. And I tell you, it's a beautiful thing. It looked like he finally grasped that, understood that, you know what I'm saying, came around. But I thought, wow, can you imagine 15, 20 years of living in the streets, drinking, feeling sorry for yourself? You know, it's one thing to have to go to prison and have bars around you and to do your time. But it's another thing to do time for something that you should never have to do time for. Nice. And so here's my last point, church, before we close then. What else do we learn from regret? Here's this truth. Only look back long enough in whatever there is some sort of regret, to be grateful that God has taken care of your past. Listen to me. People, oh, God's taking care of my future forever and ever. In heaven, all of a sudden, God won't judge me and say, let's go back. You made a lot of mistakes. I changed my mind. You're not going to be in heaven. That means your future is taken care of forever and ever and ever. But here's the part we must, the mistake we make when it comes to regret. God didn't just take care of your future forever and ever and ever. God took care of your past forever and ever and ever. Doesn't that what it says in Psalm 103? As far as the east is from what? It just keeps going. That's how far God has removed your transgression. And so any regret that should come and condemn you and bring all this stuff, you have to start to say, Satan, to hell with those thoughts where they came from. God's Word says that He has forgiven me. He has taken care of those things forever and ever and ever as far past back goes. And when you grasp that, then regret will no longer... No longer consume you and beat you up. You recognize that's not the Lord trying to harp and condemn. The Lord, I'm going to look back just long enough to be grateful, to be humble, to be more sympathetic, and to remind myself. But you know, that's all taken care of. That's not the old Herb Williams. That's not the new one. That's the one that wasn't walking in the Spirit.